it's about time to begin. As you remember, this is the talk on Can Machines Think, in which you discuss the matter one way or the other. I'd like to only make a couple of thing, remarks. It really is a question, can you program a machine to do it? A couple of other ones are, just because you want to believe that machines can think doesn't mean they can. Just because you want to think machines cannot think doesn't mean that they can't. So you have a problem discussing these things. Does anyone want to start before I start pointing my fingers at people? Nobody wants to volunteer? Lady back there. Hi. No, I do not believe that uh, computers can think. Can they hear you over there? And I challenge, I challenge anyone to disprove me. <laughs> but do you give any reasons why? Why do you think? I don't think a computer can think because it takes a, it would take a, a thinking individual to write a program to simulate thinking. I don't think that a computer is capable of, of uh, creative thought. You don't think the programs I discussed creative thought, like a checker playing routine, which clearly produced moves that surprise the che checker master? I think the programmer could come up with every single, identify every situation and come up with a move, but I don't think the computer or the program but Samuels didn't know how to play checkers, but the program he wrote learned how to play checkers, didn't it? I don't think so. Oh. Did you ever learn anything? Was yes. Was teacher telling you? Sure. Okay, you can't learn either. I'll accept that. <laughs> I'm okay, yeah, fine. Now we got to keep going. Good. Thank you. Uh, I agree with her. I don't believe machines can think. Uh, I believe that a computer is limited by its programming, but as programs become more and more complex, that appears to give the illusion of thinking. The example of the checkers program, uh, actually let me step back. We talked about chess programs quite a bit. And when you really look at what a chess program is doing, the machine is analyzing the moves in the board's positions and picking its move based on the best probability of success. Now also the uh, checkers program we talked about, uh, it certainly learned by observing moves and the success of those moves. So what it was doing was really updating its database of information and improving its analytical database and picking a probability of success. You are different. I believe so because we can create something from nothing. I, I believe that, well, look at, look at uh, Einstein's perfect example. He came up with a theory of relativity, yet what, where did he learn that? He had a creative spark that I don't think a machine can have. I think the machine is limited to the data it's programmed with. But I think we learn the same way that the computer is learning. We learn from uh, repetition. Uh, look how long it took the guy to learn how to play checkers. It took him 40 years, you know, or however long you said it took a lifetime, whereas it took the uh, computer about two, three weeks. You know, I agree, a computer program is only going to be good, or a computer is going to think as well as the program that is written that it's following. A computer doesn't really think, it executes. It executes the instructions that are written. And however good those instructions are, and the little sub-programs, the subroutines that it branches off to, to go find, to solve maybe one little block of a problem that it's already got, a subroutine that is valid for that bit. But that's kind of what we do. We learn, by, uh, we learn through repetition. It takes us a long time to learn stuff. Kind of in the, in the same context as, as what he was just saying, if you look at a, a checkers game, the world that you're looking at. for some purpose. Okay, well it's, I'm sure it's close enough. The, the, uh, the um, world that, that you're looking at is a two-dimensional board 
with a very limited number of things that have to be decided upon and the sensory input that whatever's making the decision uh, is very limited so you can you can write a program uh, to do that and and I think to think um, if you could get a computer and you could have enough input to it where the inputs that it was getting was as complex and was quantized as much as what the human body gets and the human brain gets then I think potentially you could write a program that could think but uh, you know, what you're trying to do is compare a two-dimensional case, whether it's chess or checkers, something that's very limited to uh, a human that has, you know, think at all of all the input, how it gets to the brain, whether it's touch, feel, hearing, um, you know, and it just goes to infinitum, to all the way that information gets into uh, to the human brain. So if you were writing a computer program to simulate that, the way it's going to make all the decisions, if you could quantize every bit of type of information that comes into the human brain in some way that you could uh, put a number on that to do a comparison, then sure, you could write a program to do that. Now, will that happen in the next 10, 15, 100 years? I don't know, but I, I don't think so. Um, but I think it's certainly possible. Thank you. I took a look at, uh, you know, rather than answering the question right straight out, does a computer think, uh, I sort of said, what is thinking? And, uh, you know, to me, thinking is, can I pose a question? Uh, and, and why do I, be, I, I pose a question? And the questions that I pose are based on needs. Now, what does a computer need? Uh, a computer doesn't really need anything. So I don't think that a computer based on that premise is going to be able to think because it's not going to be able to pose the questions uh, that will cause it to uh, search for answers. Does it pose a question in checkers? What move do I make? No, I think that it needs, it needs a, a, a stimulus. Okay. And that stimulus, yes, and I, my stimulus is based on my needs. A computer doesn't, okay, a computer doesn't have that initial stimulus unless I give it to to that computer and and to me that is uh, that is whether a computer thinks or not You're does familiar it with the experiments we've done here was which deprive them of sensory material no I'm not no stimulating at all for a long hour. leave floating in a tank of water with no stimuli and they have, well they'll do very much with no stimuli they, don't they turn into primal apes or something <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Uh, another point that I, I kind of took this uh, a little further, I said uh, as far as limits, I think that as a, as a human, I realize that I have limits, but does a computer realize that it has, has limits itself? And if it does have limits, if it has a self-realization, then you were talking about self-awareness. Self-awareness, exactly. exactly. And I don't think a, a computer has that, or nor will it have that capability. He mentioned, you know, thousands of inputs and and uh, and, and stimulus to a computer, but I don't think it's going to pose that question, or it's going to be able to place value on uh, on uh, certain self-aware uh, things. Somebody else wants to get involved. Uh, I think you mentioned something a little bit ago about thinking creatively. I'm not going to go quite down that line, but I think one of the things the computer does is it, it operates within whatever paradigms that the computer programmer has given it. And to be able to operate outside of those paradigms, I don't believe a computer can do, and that's one thing that humans can creatively do. For instance, Einstein's uh, discovery of the theory of relativity was operating outside of a Newtonian paradigm. Could a computer be programmed to creatively, if you want to use that word, think outside of the paradigm that was given to it. Simple observation. You were born with a small gizmo in your head to learn a language. The language you learned was the language you heard from the environment. You did not learn any other language until you got books in the environment. You only learn what was around. You learn from the environment what the environment didn't supply, you couldn't learn. 
You learn whatever country you were born in, each one of you first learned to speak that language, arbitrary from the environment completely. I agree. I'm not following where you're going with it, though. Well, I'm merely saying uh, everything you learn, you learn from your environment, too, like the machine does. It's all put in you. If you believe that, so. I, I'm not sure I do. <laughs> it's not my problem to believe. It's yours. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, regards to the question of whether machines can think or not, I don't know. But the question I ask is, do we want machines to think? And my answer to that would be no, because if machines think, <laughs> then they may become just as unre unreliable as people, forming unions, you know, uh, <laughs> traffic, traffic lights going off and on, regardless, you know, whenever they wanted to, because after all they would think and say, hey, I am bored with this, I no longer want to be a traffic light, I would rather be a, uh, you know, a, a microwave or something like that. <laughs> so I think we're actually heading in the wrong direction as to, you know, coming up with some idea that let's make marine machines think. What we want is to be able to control machines <laughs> and not allow them to think. He has a very good point all the early machines were designed to do what we wanted. But that's not what the people are trying to do, uh, get machines to think in artificial intelligence. They want to get the machine to produce things we cannot. And the question is, can they in the long run? Some more comments? Okay, we're over here, fine. I don't want to deprive you of their time on the air. Yes, sir. Uh, I approached it uh, similar to the young man up in the front row with uh, trying to define thought in the first place, I uh, figured the thought more or less evolved as a survival tool and is more or less a procedure where you start off with a perception of an environment, you anticipate a change in that environment, and then you uh, derive an appropriate uh, behavior to account for that change. Uh, this requires, obviously, first of all, the ability to sense the environment, to recognize a pattern that you can predict what's going to happen, develop an appropriate response, and either execute or at least output that response. So I think of, of thinking as more or less a, a continuum of, uh, of abilities. We all know if we've got kids or we've all had people who worked for us or we worked for who looked at the guy and just said, that person is not thinking, okay, which it, it wasn't showing the ability to think that we would see out of, say, a gun director. However, uh, we've also seen uh, people with the ability to think on a level we could never approach. And I think that the, the, the different levels of that are based on either if, in terms of sensing the environment, the ability to imagine or create a, an internal environment within which you're operating, uh, which can be very, very abstract, uh, the ability to rec recognize different complexities of patterns. Um, the likelihood of success of your reaction to whatever you anticipate being the result of those patterns, and the ability to effectively come up with a response uh, to that. So there's really, so if the bottom line answer is the way I've defined thought, yes, a machine can think. It can say a a a, uh, a missile guidance system can sense a missile coming in. It dissipate where it thinks the missile is going to go, and it can develop an appropriate reaction. But that is not necessarily the same, that same machine then would not necessarily be able to come up with the theory of relativity because it doesn't have the sensory inputs, et cetera, to achieve that. Since the subject of relativity and creativity has come up that way, let me tell you, I've made a long study of these matters. I've talked to people who've done creative, and I've examined myself how it happens. When you look closely, you find that the person is led inch by inch by inch by inch to the result. It isn't suddenly, although in some extent it is, when you look further, you see, oh yes, that reminds me of something I did earlier. Yes, that's my subconscious generating up something that I had remembered from earlier times. Most of the time, you can see things. For example, in Einstein's case, as a child, he had asked himself the question, if I go with the velocity of light, what will a light wave look like? Well, it would look like it was standing still. But he knew that the formulas for light do not permit a stationary maximum. So he knew as a child that there's something wrong with the velocity of light. If you could move that fast, you'd see things which said you couldn't see. 
Now, is it surprising he finally comes up with something where the velocity of light is limiting and relativity is what it is? He laid down the steps by asking questions earlier, inch by inch by inch, until he was led more or less to it by the hand. That's how almost all creative work occurs when you look at it. It's true you wake up in the morning and suddenly you see it. But when you stop and examine, how is it that you saw that? Oh, well, that's like I, something I did in graduate school, or that's like I, something I saw over there. Creativity is not that light bulb going on that you see in a comic strip. It's much more slow development, and much of it goes on in the subconscious until finally the moment of consciousness occurs. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a slow, steady thing, and various elements caused the thing, and you could argue, <coughs> serious with relativity, that there was no thing between step by step by step by step, cause, effect, cause, effect, and he was led to it by chance. Anybody other want to talk about things? Yes, back in the corner over here. I want to follow up on what I said before. Um, I, I tried to make the point of, of how limited uh, the environment is that the, that the computer is thinking in. And I said the chessboard game is very limited. There's a limited number of options, a limited number of inputs. And so if you were a person and that was your world, would you be thinking? And, and I believe that the computer, the chessboard game, does think in its, its environment of the chess game. Um, I compare that to the fish I have at home in a little fish tank. Does that fish that's in there swimming around, does he think? Does, does he make choices about what to do uh, in his fishbowl? And I believe that he does. Now, is he limited like, this, like the chess um, computer program? He is. His brain is much more limited than, than the human brain. And uh, the joke that goes along with that is, um, is uh, one fish says to the other, is there a god? And the other fish says, well, yeah, there must be, because every week somebody changes the water. So. What a dick. <laughs> Anyone else want to talk? I'll go back to the list if somebody doesn't want to talk. Yes. Um, I also asked a question about what is thought, what is the definition of thought, and when people are just sitting there daydreaming, are they not thinking? I believe they are, and I don't think computers are able to daydream. So if you have a broad general definition of thinking, which includes daydreaming, imagining, I don't think they can do it. You were suggesting I can't write a program which will daydream? Are you suggesting you can't? But if you do, it doesn't produce any results. Can you write a program so you don't. No. You cannot prove that it's daydreaming. You can't prove that it's you doing anything. You are you. Because there's no result. I can prove that I'm daydreaming based on the emotions that I'm feeling from it. Why should I believe you? <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. And talking about this whole idea of what is thought, which really is kind of a critical issue in this uh, discussion, obviously. Uh, one guy talked about, well, do we want computers that can think? And he said, no, they might do crazy things. I thought, well, that's kind of ridiculous. Then I thought and said, well, perhaps you could define thinking as the ability to deviate from the standard program or paradigm you had. Um, so I thought, well, maybe it's not such a ridiculous thing. Um, so could we po possibly define a computer to be thinking if it somehow has deviated from its original programming? Hard to imagine because <clears throat> you'd think that that deviation in itself was somehow programmed into the computer. Um, which also then brings us back to people and saying, are we really thinking? When we do something that seems to violate the rules that we've always followed in our life, is that very deviation something that is somehow programmed into us at a deeper level? So am I answering the question? No. It's a, I think it's a very circular argument and a very, very difficult uh, issue for that reason. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Oh, did you want one? Yeah. Oh, he was. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the air. I know the professor hates this, but when, we, when I started looking at this, I had to go to the dictionary. <laughs> and it said uh, the thinking was to exercise the powers of judgment, conception, or inference. Now, I'm not going to argue the judgment part or the inference part because with any established set of rules, you could say a computer 
you know, operates on the judgment via the rules that are given to it. And I wouldn't argue the point on people, you, you know, it, the circular argument of people operating by an established set of rules or not operating by an established set of rules. You can always say that there's a, you know, a set of rules that they're operating by that they don't realize. But that's where I want to get into thinking and the exercise of conception, the word concept. Computers, when they're operating by their set of rules, they load the rule into the CPU, they do the instruction. They know the rule, they do the instruction. They go do the branch, they do the instruction. You can say that I operate by a set you know, of standard rules, but I will also say that I don't, I don't personally always understand what those rules are. There have been times where I'm driving on the highway, why am I doing 60 miles an hour as opposed to 58 miles an hour? I don't know. You can say there's an established set of rules that are causing me to do that, but I don't understand why. The removal from the rules can be considered concept. When you say he's got the general concept, he knows what's going on, he or she knows what's going on, but they don't necessarily know all of the rules. An example for your fish is my dog. I taught my dog how to sit. I taught him how to sit in the living room. But when we go outside and I say sit, he sits. He has the general concept. He, he ignored some of the rules. He's, he may have said to himself, I'm not in the living room anymore, so I better not sit down because that's not part of the rules. Whereas a computer, if you're loading the instructions in, its set of rules are a set set of rules and it knows the rules. Whereas concept, you just need the general idea. look at rules, there's a, there's a couple of uh, different ways of looking at them. Just in the, in the, since I've been here, I've looked at uh, neural networks and genetic algorithms. And when we talk about the set of rules by which you operate, I've heard that NASA, for instance, is using a type of neural net, back propagation neural net, to <coughs> that they teach to be a flight controller. So they have an aircraft. They put it through its paces, and the flight controller learns that if the pilot puts the stick over to the right, then you better move the arrow on like so and make the plane go to the right. So that's fine. So apparently, they, in about two weeks, they can train it to do to handle the nonlinear case of flight dynamics. Uh, and what the if the if the scientists or the engineers themselves are building, it might take them six months. So that, that's a good thing. So that's a, that's a machine, a computer, that's learning. And is it thinking? Perhaps it is. What's more extraordinary is in this case, apparently they've done some, some uh, experiments, simulations, where, for instance, a fighter jet, they blow a part of the wing off. Now, now no longer, if it was just a hardwired controller that an engineer had built, no longer would just moving the stick so much would that make a difference. But because of the way that this machine continues to learn, it's able to adapt to the new circumstances. It can now control the aircraft in a matter of seconds or less. It relearns the new environment, whether it's now outside, but it's still supposed to keep the plane flying. And the pilot, the human thinking guy, can just continue to do what he does best, put the strike to the, a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left, because he couldn't have learned to control the aircraft in the time that the, that the machine did. So that's a case of an algorithm implemented, a computer, that has the right sensory input, is able to adapt, and can think out the solution to keep the aircraft in the, in the sky. Thank, thank you. Do you want to talk anymore, or are you fired? Yes, sir. Let me just make an attempt to uh, build a small bridge here. I, I believe that, that machines can think, Marines can think. Uh, <laughs> 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 right, right, exactly. Um, what, what Marines are, <laughs> now, you, now you got me doing it. Um, 
what machines cannot do is feel. Uh, and if, if, a check, if a chess program beats a human competitor, is the chess program, is that machine glad that it won? Uh, can it feel, feel happy you know, in its victory and that sort of thing? And, and that's, that's a small bridge that goes across there. Um, machines, uh, a lot, Einstein's theory of relativity has been referred to several times. Einstein did not invent relativity. It was always there. Einstein finally, through his, through application of what he, he knew, uh, finally developed the, the correct sequence of events, the correct sequence of equations that he could define relativity or he could explain it. Uh, I think it's, it's a little dangerous to only define something, something that, that terrific as thinking. Uh, every time you go home and do, do a homework or work out a problem, you obviously, by, by most, defin most people's definition, are thinking. And that's just, just a, a standard application of what you know and what you've been exposed to, to solving a problem. Uh, a machine is no different. I too looked at the idea of uh, what what exactly was thinking, and I, I came up with kind of a broad definition. I like I like the term intelligence better than thinking because in my mind I think thinking is is a very lower level of intelligence, a very broad form of intelligence. Um, I said just right down to the basics. Something that makes something um, begin to be intelligent is just being aware of its surroundings. Can a computer be aware of its surroundings? Yes, I believe it can. You can easily develop sensors that allows a computer to know any of the five senses that you have, okay? Um, then above that I say thinking, okay? Thinking is actually being able to take those senses and being able to logically put them into some sort of um, result, be able to compute something. Um, and that's all just based on your input. And I think a computer can definitely take input and give some kind of output. Granted, that's based on how you program the computer to do it, but the computer's still doing it. It's still computing. So it's, in my mind, it's thinking. Now above that I say there's, there's a certain thing called, um, for lack of a better term, I just said being smart. And I liken this to something, you probably all know the individual that can go up to the chalkboard, probably do a triple integral on the back of his head, but the same person probably doesn't have the common sense of screwing a light bulb. Okay? This person is smart in the field of, of uh, mathematics, but he, doesn't have, he lacks the common sense or, or the ability to reason out how, an, how a light bulb actually works. He can't explain what he's doing, he just does it. Okay? And then there's common sense. This is the guy that doesn't know the intricate details, but he can screw in the light bulb, he can take things and he can, he can put them together, he can uh, relate two things together and, uh, and make something work. Okay? And then above all this is just somebody that's just, just intelligent. Um, and overall intelligence is, is the sum of all these things, being able to relate one thing to another, being able to take, look at the broad picture and then zero in on, on, the, on the specifics. Currently, I think computers probably lack that ability um, because we're limited in the way we program them, okay? You know, it's like garbage in, garbage out. You hear that about computers all the time. If we're not programming them to have complete recognition of the surroundings and to be able to relate um, all the surroundings, then it's, it's really our fault. It's not the computer's fault. You know, the computer is, is like sitting there, in my mind, just is waiting um, for the ability to, to come, for us to be able to, to program them. Uh, I looked at, at another aspect of this question, too, and that's the arrogance and even of, of man to ask this kind of a question. Because I'm looking at, at, you know, for a long time, man thought that they was, he was a supreme being over everybody not only all animals and, and everything of the earth, but also other men, okay? One man was better than another because this one race was uh, stupid or they were, they were uncultured, okay? Um, I would like to think that our society has come closer to, to being able to resolve those conflicts. Well, then man thought, well, I'm supreme over all animals. Well, we know now that there's a lot of animals that, uh, that obviously think, okay? We're not... We don't hold all the cards on thinking when it comes to animals. And I just think we're at the same question with the computer now. Man doesn't want to give up that right or that, that, uh, that supremacy over a machine. You know, we don't want to be able to concede and say, yeah, the computer can think. Because once we do that, then, then what's left for us to be supreme over?
Uh, <clears throat> listening to some of the, the dialogues here, I, or some of the statements, I, I think that thinking itself is, is related to a broader issue, or broader issues, and I would say good and evil. We, we consider computers or machines uh, being uh, devices or tools that, that we use uh, either for our benefit uh, or if we want to use them to harm other people. I, I think in that connectivity, uh, as uh, I think Mike was saying, we, we can't program feelings into the, into the machines. The machines can't then reproduce the machines uh, of their own to, to do the same benefit or harm to others. Uh, at least, and not to the scope that, that humans can. I think humans possess that and, and can't yield that to anything else. I think that's what makes us unique. Um, the, the capacity really to love and to hate. I hate to bring this up, but there was a robot that killed a person. So robots are pretty good, like humans. If I gave a machine more senses than you have, would it not be able to do more? There's been some talk around here about the machine not having all the richness of input that you have. Suppose I build a machine with more sense organs than you have, and this gentleman in the corner talked about, turn it loose on a neural network which can learn from experience. Would it not now have a richer environment and do better than you? Yeah, might be. By the way, machines are now designing chips for other machines. The Pentium chip and all the other ones were designed basically by a machine. The humans gave some direction, but the bulk of the design was through the machine because no human mind could have looked at the millions of connections between all the components. Machines do design machines, and machines can design better machines than the ones they are doing the designing. And we're assembling machines by machines. So I'm not sure machines can't make better machines than themselves. The rest of the world is entitled to it too. Well, <laughs> machines making other machines, is that and, and my is that tasking or is that just uh, uh, is that reproducibility? I mean, uh, when we when we have a machine making another machine, we know the characteristics that go into the product. When 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 humans make other humans, we I mean we we've got uh, things going in that in that baby that that no one knows from generations ago that that may have come up. So I mean that's the difference I think. Uh, well, I can program that in if you wanted it. It's been agreed. It's been agreed by and large. We have wanted in the past machines that did just what we wanted. It isn't that we could not program machines to be random. They could wait until Cosmic Ray came by and then do something, or not. We can easily fix up machines to be random if you want. It's we have always, up to now practically, wanted machines that did what we wanted them to do. We want a gun director to shoot down that airplane. We don't want to go out and play checkers. Anybody else want to talk? How do you program a machine uh, with morality? Because everyone, you know, asks people what's moral in this room, and I bet you get the same number of uh, answers as there are people in the room. So, how do you do something like that? I don't have the answer. I just, just need a little more room here. Uh, I looked at this question for. Uh, can computers think? And I first said, well, how do I think? How do I do it myself? And if you just look at your body in general, all you are is a biological engine. You've got DNA that executes its code and that makes the processes inside your mind happen. And somewhere above all that, I think, is where thought comes from. And that's how I think. So I looked at a computer and said, well, what does it do? It's got a microprocessor. It's got memory. It's got little bitty instructions going in there making everything happen to it. That's just like the best parallel I could come up with is the DNA happening inside of me. So you can say a program, if you kind of define how you're going to define thinking, you can say that it's thinking on a very, very primitive level, and maybe that's what I do on a very primitive level. You start taking your programs, though, you've got things now like uh, object-oriented programming, a C language, where you're creating 
an object that reacts to other objects. But that's just part of a program inside the machine. So I'm, I'm thinking that where computers are going is you're going to see programs that, yeah, that's just executing the instruction down at the microprocessor level. But above that, you've got another level where you've got an object that was created inside the machine talking to other objects also inside the machine. And pretty soon, you'll probably have other machines all talking to each other, and you've got objects everywhere, and they're reacting to each other. But what it comes down to is I don't think you can apply your standards of thinking to a computer because you think in one particular direction, and everybody thinks in different directions. And a computer is going to think in its own direction, and it's going to have a completely different way of thought. To say it's got feelings and all that kind of stuff isn't going to apply in its world because it doesn't know that. It might have its own definition of what a feeling is, and that's what it's going to go and do. So I think morality and creative thought and all that kind of stuff and intuition are things you're applying to your world and the way you think, and that a computer will have its completely own definitions for that when it comes to that. Next. Yeah, Walt's going to answer me. No, actually, I was going to answer Stu. Uh, I think the morality issue is really an interesting one for a computer, because if you think of a computer, a computer works in a, pretty much a black and white environment. With humans, it's not that way. Um, all of us in this room can define, broadly define our own morality. But how many of us can actually say that we, we live by a strict set of morality rules? Okay? When is it okay to, to break the rules? Okay, we make those judgments. With a computer, you wouldn't do that. The computer was operating your car and the computer said, hey, I'm driving on a stretch of highway that the speed limit is 55. The computer's going to drive 55 because it doesn't have the capacity to say, well, it's okay, I don't think there's a cop around, so I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to speed. I mean, you could program that in. You could say, well, uh, if I don't detect any uh, radar guns in the area, then, okay, I'll go 10 miles over the speed limit or, or 20. But I guess the point is that on the issue of morality, it's almost as if a computer is one up on us because they can formulate a strict set of rules that they, can, that they are going to be uh, forced to follow. Um, and then the flip side of that is that, uh, that they're below us because they don't have the judgment to be able to say, when is it okay to kill? Okay? Can you kill somebody and uh, justify it if you're protecting yourself or protecting somebody else? Well, there again, you could program that into a computer. I think an interesting thing to do would be for each person to write his own computer program on his own morality and go to the issues of stealing. Write an, an if-then lip. If this is happening, then it's okay for me to steal. You know, all the way down to else, don't. Same thing with, with every issue of morality you can think of. I think it'd be an interesting thing for each individual to do. this question, I think the, the first thing I did is try to define an environment in which we should ask this question, you know, essentially the testing environment. Uh, I thought that if we study, if we compare a human with, you know, what we've learned through our life experience with a computer program with human, well, that would give us the wrong answer. Essentially, you're, you're biasing the whole, the whole issue because you're asking a human to program a computer. So I think the true the test would, is really to look at what a computer can learn and do on its own by using you know, any kind of, uh, of either existing or even what we can foresee in terms of algorithm, like learning algorithm, like a, what Ian talked about, neural networks, gene genetic algorithms, and all that. And I think then I looked at the result of you know, we have this computer, assuming that he has the, the same or even better sensory uh, perception. I guess that, that, that we have and, and see what it can do. And I guess the easy for me and always answer that I gave myself was that the computer can be very, very good as a, at acquiring information. Uh, you know, it can learn all kinds of things from what it can see. But what it can't do is acquire uh, understanding of what it sees. Okay, that's where I feel that humans are better than computers and will remain better than computers for you know the foreseeable future. When we see something, we do, you know we don't only you know if you see a ball fall on the floor, you don't I mean you can't calculate the formula exactly. The computer, if you know with the proper program, proper perceptors, can look at it and say, okay, this is the equation of the falling ball. Okay, I have it. But the computer won't ask why. Okay, so I think what what it comes up to is that humans, because of feelings and 
and everything else that makes us because we are motivated to always ask, well, why is it doing this? And that's why we, you know, since the beginning of time, we've evolved, we've found things that were not in our environment that, you know, I think uh, even Einstein, um, a lot of these, a lot of the, uh, the theories and all that about, you know, astrophysics or whatever, were all from humans based on things that we cannot observe. I think you, computers, if you could have, uh, you know, observed an experiment with, you know, E equals MC squared, they would have found the end, you know, they would have found the formula, but they can't come up with the why. Yeah, the, the issue, of course, is, is thinking, but uh, the question I would have is, are computers really thinking like the chess programs, or are they simulating the thinking? I think that's coming up bef before, whereas we have a chess uh, master and, and uh, is thinking maybe 100 moves down the road, can defeat a computer who's thinking of moves a million times a second. So what is there different in the chess master that, that may allows him to beat a computer? Well. Perhaps the chess master is, is thinking uh, on some different level than the computer is uh, crunching numbers, which is really what a computer does. So, you know, we can look at it. We can do programs that kind of simulate the thinking, but really it's a computer crunching numbers. Uh, so maybe the question would be, could somebody write a program for a computer to answer the question, can a computer think? Well. Yes, you could probably uh, write a program and he could discuss that, but it wouldn't be the computer discussing it. It would be the program. Uh, he spoke of uh, simulating intelligence. I would say there are frequently times when the teacher feels a class is only simulating intelligence. <laughs> Any more? Yes, sir. If a computer, let me see if I can get this right. Right now we have computers that are designing computers. Uh, let's look down the road. Maybe we, maybe we can see it coming, maybe we can't. But what's to stop a computer from finally learning to write its own programs? Here we are talking, well, right now we control the computer. We, we write the programs and we keep it within our bounds. Well, I mean, look at the caveman and look at even beyond as, as man evolved. Man didn't know very much lots of years ago but over the years it's evolved or we've evolved and we've become what we are now well it's been demonstrated that computers can do it a lot faster uh, learn that it well if you take the checkers game and call that learning you know maybe on the most primitive step but what's to stop if once a computer can say well can write a code all by itself compile it and learn that way you know I mean we're applying our set of learning rules to the computer whereas maybe the computer has its own set of learning rules and once we might be at right now at too low a level to see it but it could break through the barrier to to where it'll write its own programs and figure out things the way it needs to it takes its own subroutines or whatever as it needs it to solve whatever problem you give it you know who's to say and maybe it'll take a thousand years or whatever but who's to say it won't uh, happen Well, it's getting near the end of the time. Let me say that I am pleasantly surprised how well you've done on the average, and I congratulate those who spoke and those who kept quiet. I don't congratulate. Let's quit for today, and we'll resume Friday on N-dimensional space.